from all over the world, welcome. I'm tuning in today from Krakow uh, with about a half a meter of snow outside. Um, so pretty nice and cool. And I'm just going to introduce myself, the project that this talk is a part of, and then I'm going to introduce our lovely Kate, who's going to facilitate this talk for us. Um, my name is Kasia Vitek, and I'm a dance artist, choreographer, performance maker. Uh, as an organizer of this talk, I just wanted to briefly introduce um, this project, uh, this talk, and the reason for bringing it on, um, personal reason for me, really. Um, so this meeting is a part of a wider dance performance project called Solastalgia. The performance itself is a dance piece. Uh, it's a theater-based work. And it has been acting sort of as a vehicle for me to look closer at the emotional um, turmoil, you could say, uh, that myself, my close circle of people have been in, in relation to climate catastrophe, but also um, many other recent um, world traumas, grief, etc. Um, so as a part of this project, we have also planned and designed a series of movement workshops, uh, dance workshops, mindfulness workshops. Um, they've been designed in part with Derby University, CPA, um, close friends of mine who are artists and art therapists. And these movement workshops are meant to create safe space and time for exploring these these emotions in a sort of supportive way. Um, and this talk has a very important place for me because I wanted to also open the space to fellow artists to hear how you, they may feel, how it is to make work uh, on such a subject. Um, and I think here I will introduce the lovely Kate, who's been doing that kind of work for a while now. Um, so a few words for those who don't know Kate. Um, I've had a beautiful write-up, Kate, for you here, and now it's just spontaneously disappeared. Good. Make one up. <laughs> no, I can't make one up because it was really beautiful. So let me just find it. So. Yes, Kate. She's a member of the board of directors for the Climate Psychology Alliance, but also a lecturer at the University of Salford, a facilitator and a performance maker. Her work explores how we create spaces of playfulness and joy as we struggle to face the difficult truths and emotions of the climate and ecological crisis. That is a very brief summary, but I think uh, not only myself, most of us would love to hear more from you. So um, I'm gonna pass the button on to you for now and potentially come back to any questions to me later. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, thank you very much. And it's, um, Really a pleasure to be here with you. So thank you for inviting me. And I'm really looking forward to seeing your performance in January as well. So, um, yeah. Um, what I'm going to do today is I am going to say a couple of things about the Climate Psychology Alliance um, that Kasia mentioned. We've been working with her on the project. And um, I'm, I'm also going to talk through a few of the kind of key ideas um, around the way that we respond to the climate and ecological crisis emotionally <laughs> and psycho psychologically. Um, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, how that fits in with the arts and what I've been working on. 
And then I'm going to invite people to spend a little bit of time in smaller groups and we'll use breakout groups so people can have some discussion about their own experiences and responses to that and then bring that back and see what we've got all together at the end of it, whether there's some questions and whatever. Um, and so I kind of wanted to start um, by asking you if you'd like to and you're able to to stand up if you prefer to stay sitting you can but um i really um wanted to just give us two or three minutes um to ground ourselves here and have a few breaths so i hope you can i hope you can still hear me and I'm going to ask you just to stand with your feet shoulder width apart or sit with your feet kind of right nicely under your knees and nice and sit up straight so you can feel gravity pulling you down into the ground. Maybe if you're sitting, it's through your seat bones and through your feet. And if you're standing, like really getting a sense of how you're balanced across your two feet right in the center, possibly just a little bit towards the heels, really kind of feeling into the ground. And just for a moment, kind of imagine the ground beneath your feet and bring your awareness to the contact between your feet and the ground beneath you. And we're just gonna do a tiny little breathing exercise just to just to open our lungs up and i'm going to ask you to do a, a little um a little bit of an open to the sky and a close down to the earth so we're going to take just three breaths and we're going to breathe in nice and slow and open the chest out and up to the sky and breathe out and just curl down and send our breath down to the earth. And up, in, out to the sky and just down to the earth beneath us. And up and down to the earth beneath us. And just take a moment to bring your attention back to your feet. And that if we imagine through our feet, we've got the earth beneath us and we've got the universe around us and that we're really on the earth. And that possibly, if we really, if we imagine that maybe we have little roots that grow through our feet, possibly, maybe, we can find our way to connect with each other across this unfortunate digital space that we're inhabiting. So I'd like to invite you to come back. And it's, it's always a strange feeling being in a Zoom room with so many people so, so far away but also just, you know, I want to kind of feel like we're all on this earth here together and um, and that we are connected to each other and to the people that we love outside of this Zoom room at the same time. Um, so, um, yes, I said I would say a little bit about the Climate Psychology Alliance, and I'm very grateful to be a part of the Climate Psychology Alliance, to be a member of, of this organisation. Um, I came to that through my um, creative practice because I was making work and I was really concerned about the way that when we're opening up these conversations through our artistic practice about ecology, about our relationship with nature, about the ecological uh, climate crisis, that actually um, we're potentially um, 
we're going into a situation with an audience that we don't know anything about and that there's the potential to um, set off people's defences. There's the potential for that to perhaps be an experience that doesn't um, move someone in a, in a positive direction. And I really wanted to understand a little bit better, thinking about my own dramaturgy, thinking about the way that I structure the experience of being together, either in a workshop or in a performance. That means that we're able to go into difficult places, but we're also able to hold that alongside the full range of different emotions and, and to have an encounter with um, emotions that we find hard to engage with um, without necessarily pushing those away. And I work in interdisciplinary performance, so a mixture of, of movement and theatre and music um, and um, bad drawing on stage. Um, and so the, the playfulness and the joy of making and of sharing and of exploring relationships um, is absolutely central to kind of what I'm doing. And I'm working in a non-fictional form or what I call speculative non-fiction in that I'm working with scientists on stage. Um, we're inhabiting the stage as versions of ourselves. And I think that the there's something really interesting about the vulnerability of being present with the reality of where we are together in that space of making work and sharing work and being with an audience and so i was reading all sorts of interesting things and at a certain point i kind of realized oh all of these interesting things i'm reading seem to have been written by people who are part of this organization called the climate psychology alliance maybe i should look them up um and I became very interested in the different forms that um, were coming out of that research in the more psychotherapeutic and related areas. And I'm just going to read you a quotation from um, a book that was published last year, Climate Psychology, A Matter of Life and Death. And it's a definition of climate psychology. And it says that climate psychology explores current existential anxiety and its associated defences. Lovely. It explores the ways old beliefs can be relinquished and the ways we can open up to new ones. It imagines new sets of practices, forms of support, ways of living and being with that can help communities survive and thrive. And there's so much in common between what I think really socially and community engaged artistic practice is wanting to offer and to create in this context um, in common with what I'm seeing in that kind of climate psychology context, where interestingly enough, there is a, a shift from a more individualistic thinking about psychology to a more communal and collective one in a lot of people's thinking. So I found a really nice kind of connection there in that organization. And some of the things that we, I can say we, because I'm strongly a part of the organization now, um, some of the things that we do are research, of course, which I've mentioned, um, but also a wide range of different kinds of support for people. Um, whether that's individuals or communities. So support for young people, parent circles for parents who, who are looking for uh, a space to talk about the, the specific issues that relate to parenting in a time of um, climate crisis. Climate cafes, which anyone can show up to and talk about their emotions and reflections. One-to-one -one therapeutic support. So there are a whole load of psychotherapists across the country and beyond who are willing to offer three sessions of free um, therapeutic support to people who are having difficulties in coping with the climate crisis for whatever reason. Um, and, and talks, of course, and workshops for various different groups of people. So there are all kinds of different things happening, as well as events, you know, with our members exploring and, and opening up different ideas and possibilities and training people um, as climate aware 
therapists. So it's a very, it's an organization that I kind of feel very close to my heart. Um, and, um, and I wanted to kind of say a few of the things that we're doing because actually those are offerings, particularly some of the support offerings that can be very helpful when we're putting ourselves in relation to this crisis and when we're working in the depth that we do, particularly in the arts, with those emotions, with the inner conflicts that are associated with it. So I was going to start, but I feel like I've already started, I've said loads already, but I'm going to start <laughs> with um, the title of a chapter um, by Bayo Akomalafe in uh, a book, Holding the Hope, because his, his chapter asks the question, what does it mean to be well in unwell times? And that struck me very, very strongly um, how to find a way to be well that isn't the well that we understand it to be according to the systems um, that we live in. And he says that we need a different form of healthiness or well-being that addresses our indebtedness to the world we never separated from. And so he's talking about our indebtedness to the natural world, the world that we're a part of, that we have never separated from, but because of the way that we live in this very consumer capitalist society, we have constructed an imagined separation from the world that we are um, a part of, that we are nature as well as being, you know, we don't just go out into it, we can go into it here as well. Um, and so, I think that's a really good frame for thinking about the conversations that we're going to have and for thinking about like what what direction we want to move in in terms of um how we move away from a more kind of defensive and fearful place into something that is more regenerative and that is more connected with ourselves with each other and with the kind of the whole more than human world that's out there. Um, so the first thing I, I'm kind of interested in, I suppose, to talk about is the way we talk about this issue. Because one of the reasons that the Climate Cafe appeared um, in the world is that we don't talk about our feelings and our um, the sense of, of uh, we don't talk about the climate crisis. And so a lot of people uh, feel very alone and don't feel able to talk about it in their everyday life. And there's a really um, a helpful um, kind of term uh, from a cognitive anthropologist, Zeru Bavel, who, who talks about socially negotiated silence. And I find this quite a useful way of talking about this, this quieting of our conversations and our feelings, because it recognizes the fact that it's not just that we don't talk about it, it's not just a silence, it's that we don't talk about the fact that we don't talk about it, it's a meta silence. And so it's an implicitly agreed quiet or silencing. It's socially constructed. No one's saying, well, actually some people are saying you shouldn't talk about climate change, um, but mostly, the conversation is happening. And so then the next thing I'm interested in after that is, well, we're now talking about it quite a lot. I mean, most of the people here are probably talking about it quite a lot. And it's in the news, it's everywhere, but depending on what you read. But where are there still silences? So where are the areas where it still isn't being talked about in the same way? And where are the times where we can talk about it? So I'm interested in, in your um, views on this. I'm very, we've got, you know, a few people here and I'm interested in the times, if you don't mind putting in the chat, a little bit of a sharing. When, wh what are the things that still don't feel okay to talk about? Because it might not be the whole of the situation. It might be parts of the situation. 
and when don't they feel okay to talk about? Are there particular times when you wouldn't talk about the climate crisis or biodiversity loss? Are there particular times you wouldn't talk about, I don't know, the colonial underpinnings and extractivism that 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 form the kind of center of of what crisis we're in? Mm. Yes. I'll put a heart on why I'm vegan. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, Kate, um, just because my daughter came here, a good example as well, raising a vegan child. Mm. Um, Bringing that around people uh, turns a lot of heads no. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah ableism and racism in the the some of those conversations really really scary the madness of flying mm. the food tech industry mm. Mm. And I'm interested in in when are the places and the times where it does feel comfortable to talk about it. Is meeting people walking with the dog a time when it does feel comfortable, Kate Duft? Excellent, I love that, absolutely love it. Um, with other activists, yes. Um, potential harm digestate from biogenerators could possibly have on soil microbe communities. Mm. Climate Justice Workshop, Climate Cafe. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I think the one of the things I find really difficult is um, even with with people who are reasonably engaged, um, I find it really difficult to talk about how bad it is um, because I really, I, I really want to go on your forest th therapy walks. Sorry, that's a little aside I just saw in the chat and I, I interrupt myself. Um, yeah, I, I find it really difficult because um, I'm, um, different people have different levels of optimism around this and and I find one of the things that I find particularly hard is knowing that it is very bad um and not feeling and feeling bad to share that with people who perhaps don't know how bad it is particularly people that I love um because I think um there's there's something in um you know it is very bad and there's something in that sense of shift in the way that I've started making choices in my life um, because um, I 
I think that we are a, we are in a harm reducing phase rather than a, um, a a place where we're likely to turn things around. And so I find that very difficult. And I feel guilty for telling people. And so it's really interesting. Like you can go from the kind of why won't people listen to the actually feeling like I I I don't know if I can bring myself to talk about this to this person because it's so painful. And why would I want to share that with someone in that way um but our first if we're if we're going for strategies for coping with the climate crisis which i i think i may have promised in the blurb our first uh, strategy for coping with the climate crisis is actually to talk about emotions and reflections with others that you trust and it is um it's it, it's just really important to find those places where we can talk to people um and um and talk about how we are genuinely feeling and and also to open spaces for other people and to accept certain level of discomfort for ourselves as well in territory we might not be familiar with because it goes in both directions um and it's that kind of being being open to um holding discomfort i suppose um i'm also curious while we're making good use of the chat um just to hear a little bit from you about where you are in terms of your feelings about the climate and ecological crisis um how how what emotions might have been coming up for you um out there um all around the world um I'm aware that we're going through COP at the moment, which is pretty intense. Yeah. I think um, deep grief is very strong for me as well. Mm. Frustrated, anxious, scared dismay, anger, resignation, nebulous sadness, grief, anger, bafflement, avoidance, yes, not wanting to experience the deep grief, deep grief, fury. Mm. I think that sometimes also we just, you know, we shut down as well. We just get overwhelmed and we can't really engage with it. And and it's fine, you know, we and we can't feel things and or sometimes we feel numb. It's not always about feeling emotions. Sometimes it's about recognizing that we're not feeling them at the moment for whatever reason. And and that's fine as well. Um, sadness and fear. Mm. Yeah, guilty is a is a strong one, I think, as well, for those of us particularly um, living in, in more privileged places. Um, and can I ask if anyone has encountered any, I don't know if I can say that now, I've just seen that the, the completely distraught. Um, yeah. Mm. It's, I think COP is a really difficult time and that sense of the crushing of hope because there's a sense of putting faith in these people to make decisions which, which are not being made and that it's, um, it's been a very, very upsetting week. Um, mm, yes, very colonially based, absolutely. I'm going to ask a difficult question. Does anyone ever encounter any positive emotions in relation to the climate and ecological crisis and their work perhaps in, in that? Hope. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. connection and joy growing food and tending soil 
My parents' community garden brings me hope and other stories of small scale localized actions around the world bring me hope. But yeah, still the anger at the same time. And it's the holding of these different things simultaneously that can sometimes be difficult. Mm. Yeah. It's a relief at the possibility that existing systems might fall and new potentialities might emerge. I think there's a lot of, it's like, it's a very painful kind of combination there. Mm. Yeah, I think the, the crisis can bring out the opportunity to deeply collect, connect. Um, and and I think it's it's really important to hold the positive things next to the negative things. Um, one of the uh, one of the things that I've realized very strongly through my own relationship with the natural world is that there is so much grief for loss, but there's also in that there's connection and also in that there's love um, because we never ever feel grief or loss unless we love something. And I think that love is very, very central to all of the feelings that are coming out and that love and compassion and um, our, our sense of connection to the world around us are the reasons that we feel these, these more, these difficult and, and, um, quite painful emotions and that that there's always one with the other and and accepting and valuing the whole kind of emotional um, mess um, and I'm going to share uh, I'm going to do the awful thing that um, I, I don't usually I don't like but I'm going to um, can you make my, I've, I've made you host Cassia and now I can't share because I was so scared of dropping out. Can you, can you make it possible for me to share or host me or something? I'll do my best. Mm. Um, because I want to show you a little image of a load of emotions. And um, I also have come to the point where um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of climate psychology ideas and I know that if I have a the PowerPoint image there it's just going to make it a little bit easier for me to be coherent um, <laughs> and that's that's the honest truth. So this is just a collection of emotions that I've gathered over conversations <laughs> and um, and the overwhelm has been very, very strong for a lot of people. Um, it, and and I, it's very strong for me as well. And it's one of the reasons that sometimes we do need to disconnect. Um, but I really want to kind of go the second kind of uh, strategy for coping reasonably well, as well as we can. And, you know, in the circumstances is to really, really accept and value all of the emotions and, and to be present with all of the emotions, which means, yes, facing some painful emotions sometimes and sitting with some painful emotions and having to go through those. But it also means accepting positive emotions as well, because sometimes it's very easy to get caught up in the, the anger or to get caught up in the frustration. And it can those emotions can overwhelm some of the more gentle emotions that might be coming through underneath that might be to do with love that that is the reason for that grief um or that might be to do with courage that is actually what we're doing with that fear and so i just wanted to visually put a load of uh, lovely emotions and also draw attention to the fact that as people who work in the arts those of us here who work in the arts that actually, this is very often the material that we work with and that we, we dive into these spaces with such intensity in order to open them out, in order to find out what's there, in order to allow things to emerge through our bodies, through our words, through our visual images, so that we can open up a space for 
uh, the people that we connect with through our artistic practice. And so it's not just, I think, in everyday life where we have to sit with these emotions in order to be in contact with the world that we're in and to be really present in the reality we're in, but also when we're working artistically, that we have a, a different relationship with these emotions and that we actually go into these places in order to open them out for other people and to facilitate an experience and to go into vulnerable places in order to facilitate that experience. And one of the areas of interest in my work is the way that we actually practice vulnerability through our artistic practice. Um, and that we take ourselves into spaces of risk in a strategic way um, in order to understand better what's possible and what's there, and then to share that with our audiences, with the people we work with in workshops, in a space that is compassionate and hospitable for their emotions and safer for them. And that the artists who open up these spaces need to go to these dark spaces. And, and to do so is risky. And so part of what I wanted to say in this talk is to ask ourselves the question, how do we open spaces for ourselves of support and gathering in order to be able to hold this when holding this is too much? Because the kind of work we do with the climate crisis is always too much. And it doesn't end. So when you do a piece, so I, I made a piece about grief and losing a close friend of mine a few years ago. I couldn't work on the climate crisis until I dealt with grief. And uh, so the, the, the grief was easier. And um, that, that process of, of, of actually putting myself into a relationship with my own grief in order to open up a space for other people to consider and to feel and to relate to what grief means in society um, was a very, it was a very powerful um, and also risky process. And the questions for me, I suppose, coming out of that are, what do we need to put, what do we need to do for ourselves and each other in the different places that we that we encounter these emotions so i'm going to i'm going to leave that thought with us for later and i am just going to um focus a bit more on grief because i think this comes to the heart of some of what we need to be engaging with um because although it's not all about grief it seems from, from all reports, it seems that grief is at the heart of this. And it came out in your chat and it comes out in research. It comes out again and again in workshops that grief is, is really at the heart of this because we're facing loss, but we're not facing loss. That It's just one loss. It's not just the loss of my friend when I was young. It's loss and loss and loss and loss and loss again and again. And it's also kind of dispersed and it's difficult to understand. And so I'm sharing here on screen um, the four tasks of mourning adapted from Worden's four tasks of mourning as a way of just looking at actually what our process is, and we all have different processes in the way that we engage with the climate crisis, with biodiversity loss, with the loss of, you know, perhaps our own land, perhaps our own homes, perhaps people we love, um, and that there is a process of accepting loss intellectually and emotionally, 
and actually going through the pain of grief and that that contains a lot of different emotions as well. And it's that sitting, again, sitting with quite painful emotions and then adjusting to a world without whatever, whomever has been lost because it is, it's a new environment. It's, it's a new sense of self and the world. And when I, when I read this, it makes me think about that moment when you realize actually, no, everything is going to change. And we need to move ourselves with that change in the best possible way we can, but everything is going to change and we are going to lose, you know, we're going to lose a lot. Um, and then finding a way to remember whomever has been lost while embarking on the rest of one's journey through life. This idea that we continue and that we keep going and that we keep living and that we keep having all of those positive emotions as well as all of those difficult emotions and that we keep staying present with our own desire to run away from this. Um, because unsurprisingly, when you look at it like this, and we, when we say all of these emotions, we, we've, we've put all these emotions in the chat. We've, we, we've recognized how difficult it is to talk about it. So of course people want to run away from it. Of course it's, it's terrifying. Of course people want to run away from it. Of course people want to not deny it. Um, and um, I think there's a sense in which our our inner conflicts, and I, I remember someone brought up guilt in the chat already, but our sense of being uncomfortable with how we live, knowing that everything we do continues to contribute this to this, that means there's a kind of, there's always a barrier to really grieving for what we're losing because we're always trying to distance ourselves from it a little bit in order to keep ourselves safe. Um, and I, I really, I, I wanted to share this little quotation, tiny one, on melancholia from Renee Lertzman, because she writes about, um, and she did quite a lot of research um, underpinning this, about the way that people were experiencing melancholia in relation to their environment. And it's an interesting connection with the tholestalgia, um, I think, as well, for Cassia's project because the melancholia is the quality of loss, but without the clear origin or cause. That sense that we feel like we're losing something, but we can't quite put our finger on it. And I think there's a sense that it's, there's, we're losing stuff all the time, but we feel like we shouldn't be. And I'm, I, and it, it kind of connects to our sense of also not wanting to fully face this. Um, and I've just seen in the chat, I can't read the chat most of the time, but um, I've seen um, if a friend has died, you can't take any stop, steps to stop them dying. So I'm finding it difficult to apply mourning to the climate emergency. And I just wanted to bring that from the chat into this at this moment, because I just think, um it's it's really really difficult um i think that it's about this sense of the continuation of it and it's exactly this is that there's no sense of closure there's no sense of this is something that has happened it's something that's happening and happening and happening and that we feel like we should be able to stop it but we can't and so it's particularly difficult to mourn it's particularly difficult to grieve for what we are losing because it's mixed in with so much else it's mixed in with so much inner conflict so much anger so much frustration at not being able to do the things that we want to be able to do to change things and not having that power um, at the same time the people who are losing their homes, the people who lose their loved ones, the people 
who are losing their land and really losing a sense of a, a, a way of living um, or a livelihood will need to grieve. And I also think that we also will need to grieve for the ways of life that we are losing. And that comes along with the guilt for having had the privilege to have them in the first place. But it doesn't mean that we don't have to we don't have to mourn the loss of what we have imagined as our future. So if we have imagined one future and we realize that future's not possible anymore, that we need to let go of that. And, you know, and and so it's a very, very messy thing. So I, I really um, appreciate that. Um, comment because it's a really difficult thing um and i wanted to also share some what what i call not so helpful maladaptive defenses and um because we all know about you know people who are in denial <laughs> that's one thing we all know about people who are in you know full conspiracy theory denial that's one thing but the other kinds of defences where perhaps it's not a full denial, but we maybe distort the facts or we put the put put the threat a little bit into the future um, or we put the blame mainly on Rishi Sunak, which is understandable. But, you know, um, we still have to take responsibility ourselves, even if we really desperately want to fully blame um, the politicians around us. Um, the avoiding of difficult emotions. Um, sometimes avoiding difficult emotions is helpful. So what I would say here is it really, it really depends on the moment. Sometimes it's really important to avoid difficult emotions because you need to do something. You need to act. You need to deal with the situation. However, if we totally avoid difficult emotions, then we're not really present with where we are i'm a big fan of escapism i'm i'm i i'm a bit of a sucker for avoiding difficult emotions uh compartmentalizing put it in a box put it behind a wall withdraw into routine um diversionary activity i recycle so that'll do <laughs> um displaced commitments um that that kind of sense of putting energy into things that are that that make us feel like we're doing something when we're not um, at the same time, I also want to say, yes, but we do need to value small changes because small changes lead to big changes. So, you know, sometimes a minor behavior change, if it's the only thing you do, OK, but a minor behavior change might be the first thing that helps someone make another change and another change and another change. Wishful and magical thinking. We all love wishful and magical thinking and unrealistic optimism. Unfortunately, it doesn't get us anywhere. Um, materialistic or status focused behavior to enhance self-esteem or sense of security and being in control. Um, yeah. Um, it's, it's nice to feel in control of situations and it's nice to feel that we're good and it's nice to feel that we're doing the right thing. Um, and I think one of the, reasons that it's very easy for us to fall into some of these is that we do experience the climate crisis as a threat and we experience it as a threat not just to our physical and our existential kind of selves it's not just a future threat to our homes. It's a psychological threat to us now because those emotions are so painful and because it asks us to change who we think we are. It asks us to change what we believe is, is our sense of purpose sometimes. It asks us to change, asks us to, to not tour internationally or to tour internationally very slowly. It asks us to question whether our egos as artists are the most important things. It, it really, it, it asks us 
to admit our complicity with colonial structures that underpin the climate and ecological crisis when you know we inevitably those of us who live in the global north know that everything we buy and everything we do contributes to this situation and we can't just project that onto Rishi Sunak and his private jet although I do like it a little bit um that that it's very difficult to avoid this this feeling of 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 wanting to escape the situation we're in so what do we do that is the question um are there any easy answers no um we i've stolen this slide and i can't remember who i've stolen it from i've either stolen it from nadine andrews or rebecca nesta and so thank you nadine or rebecca um because uh that is unfortunately um the first mammal to go extinct due to climate change which is very sad because it's very cute and um if we're going to reconnect with ourselves with nature with our community um with compassion connection care trust vulnerability create regenerative relationships and a regenerative relationship with the earth as well then we need to find ways of admitting to ourselves when we want to avoid things when we want to shift into escapism not judging ourselves not getting worked up about it you know admitting like face face where we are that it is scary that the emotions are horrible but also find some strategies and so these are not i can't claim these are my strategies for coping but i use a lot of them and um a couple of them we've already talked about um but i wanted to share particularly the creating frames for engagement and frames for rest because um that's been really important to me in being able to continue to work and to do things which is to actually intentionally rest so if i feel like i'm avoiding if i feel like i'm slipping into kind of defenses against it or running away from it i know that i need to rest and to consciously really take care of ourselves um and really look at how we rest from thinking feeling and acting on the climate and ecological crisis in order to have the energy to continue to do so for the long term um so i'm putting this here as a kind of starting point connection with nature is probably the number one for me but different people will have different things and um and i'm also going to note that this is not about individual stuff some of it's individual but it's also about collective stuff and what in the westernized world we lack is very often collective processes for things like grief particularly um for self expression for sharing our feelings accepting those emotions acknowledging those emotions and so it's a combination of of how we how we find ways for ourselves to to work and how we really find ways collectively um and thinking in relation to the arts i just want to kind of really um think about that in terms of the different processes that we go through as artists and the different people we collaborate with and the different needs that different people have when we're working on this area in the arts because in order for the arts to be able to open up these emotions and create these very beautiful complex embodied explorations of our experience 
we need to take ourselves through these processes of creating and what are the ways that we are going to do that in the long term how are we addressing ourselves to process and how we integrate strategies and cultures of care into our collaborative processes into improvisation into the process of structuring and bringing something together um, how do we integrate that into the process of rehearsing if we're rehearsing live work that mo the moments of realizing as you as you speak or you move in front of an audience and the aftermath how do we cope with the post performance drop which in this circumstance can can be horrendous absolutely horrendous um and 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 what are we what are we doing for ourselves and each other and i kind of feel like this applies to every every everywhere we're working with this so it's not just artists if you are a scientist each aspect of the process that you go through in your work all of the different points of collaboration when you're working on climate change as a scientist have different dynamics have different ways of engaging that it, doing field work is different from write up peer reviewing is different again and the whole experience of the artist is different because the entire discourse pushes a kind of stripping out of emotion from the way that people communicate so i'm aware we've got different people from different backgrounds here but i am going to um see if i can put people into breakout groups um, just to have 10 minutes of, of conversation about where you are, strategies that you have found, practices that you are exploring or what you would like, what would be um, the best way to go forward. I'm trying to find the, I know this is mad, but I'm trying to find the um, groups thing. How embarrassing. It's so long since I've used Zoom that I don't know how to put people into breakout rooms. Possibly. We'll just have a chat here. Possibly, I don't have breakout rooms. Hmm. I don't really know how to do that either. Well, I think it might be um, about the um, setup of the meeting, unfortunately, um, because it doesn't seem to be an option. Um, I'm host again, but it would have been, yes, I am set up as host, um, but um, it seems not to be available as an option. How bizarre. Well, I think I'm not going to worry and I'm going to invite people um, to share because I don't think, um, for whatever reason, there are there's no um, option to put you into breakout rooms. And I apologize for that because I really, really wanted for you to be able to have some conversations in smaller groups where that can be a little bit richer because it is very difficult to have a conversation with 26 people um and um it's definitely not available as an option yes it ends at half past is the answer um and I'm, yes, 
I'm so sorry. I don't know why it doesn't work. Um, okay, well, <laughs> in that case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, I'm going to share with you um, a quotation um, to um, kind of bring us back into a kind of focused point um, and then I'll invite people's um, questions, thoughts and just put your hands up um, in order to kind of share particularly the strategies that we're using um, in order to kind of cope with the um, the situation we find ourselves in and order and in order to kind of facilitate the kinds of beautiful moments that we can make through the arts. And so I'm going to share this quotation again from Beo Akomalafe, um, who says, may this new decade be remembered as the decade of the strange path of the third way of the broken binary, of the traversal disruption, the chaotic moment, the post-human movement for emancipation, the gift of disorientation that opened up new places of power and of slow limbs. Which is, for me, a very beautiful way of thinking about how our own practice and our own artistic work might open up something somehow akin to a strange path. Um, so I'm just going to open up to, um, if you want to put something in the chat, a question, a comment, advice on um, really beautiful ways that you support each other in artistic practice, please do. I can see people making contacts. Okay. And Kasia, um, um, Kasia, I'm very curious as well about your own um, processes with this, because um, in the way that I've been working uh, with my lovely colleague, Ali, two of the things that I've noticed in the process, we made a show, she made a show called Mushroom Language, I've been dramaturging for her, was one, the very beautiful checking in and checking out at the beginning of rehearsals, which also reminds me of climate psychology, good practice of checking in and checking in, out. And the, the real genuine emotional honesty of the checking in and checking out and what that means. And two, the integrating of the breath and movement practices into key moments as we were going through the process of improvising and moving. Um, and three, the open, open warm up. So open moving together and sharing just moving practice at the beginning of rehearsals, all of which for me, really, as as one of the contributors in that was really, really helpful. Um, and so that that I suppose, in terms of a starting point for um, really very beautiful, um, good practices in process was really, really lovely. And it, it it meant that there was a, a starting point of of a kind of um, very gentle emotional honesty, but real emotional honesty um, that meant that we stayed present. And it is it's the staying with the trouble in a way that Donna Haraway talks about, where we stay with where we are, and it's finding ways to stay with where we are that was really. Um, really important and to be well with where we are even even though that's challenging um sometimes um so that's a it's a shout out to um ali who was leading that project particularly you know kate and um in relation to what you were saying and what to amanda was just saying in the chat um all these practices uh are, are really useful 
uh, beyond useful. They're also very informative on how to seek. Uh, I would even go as far as to how to seek solutions. <laughs> even obviously I don't have any, but um, for me, they are residing in the body. Mm. Um, so, so kind of, yeah. Sorry. Um, but also, um, if anyone is looking for uh, um, learning more about uh, being more informed about trauma and how to work with your collaborators with these tools like breath work, movement work, um, one of the um, sessions that I've organized as part of this project was with an amazing group called Play for Progress. They based in Croydon. Um, they uh, they are a group of artists. It's, it was artists led, and now I think it's been passed on. Um, and they also train in this kind of way. They train artists, and not only in mm -hmm. this kind of way. So you can lead workshops, but also breathing sessions, etc. Um, but be more informed uh, about how that can affect people. Uh, who are dealing with situations like this or like yeah. emotions this heavy. Um, sorry, she's just throwing me off a little bit here. Um, but play for progress. I'm going to pop it in the chat. If you're yeah. looking um, to train yourself or your organization or yourself as an artist, if you're working with collaborators, they do these kind of sessions and they're really beautiful. Uh, so mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think um, that, that sounds really useful and very beautiful. And I mean, the movement stuff I saw, so Hannah saying movement, stretching, dancing helps me get in my body, um, connect with myself. I think there's something about the, um, the kind of embodied imagining and being present and really that, and just that, that sense of, um, dropping into the body and into the breath that makes such a huge difference not just in the moment as you're as you're there but also in the long term in terms of having a kind of long-term practice that has made a huge difference to me and it's only a short time that I've you know I've been doing a daily practice every for about two years we have Amanda who also Ooh, hand up yeah, please come in. You would have to unmute her, yeah. Oh. I've just, yeah. Hi. Oh, Hello, can you? Yeah, so, yeah, really um, glad to be here and listening to um, what you're presenting. Thank you. Um, my experience of trauma is one of deep, um, hidden for so many years, personally. And I didn't wasn't even aware. Mm -hmm. I was holding till I came into work training, and then later psychotherapy training. And that breath work was the worst thing possible for me to actually um, engage with, because the moment that someone tried to ask me to breathe deeper brought on panic and um i think a lot of trauma informed practices don't actually understand this mm. and the more that people are chronically um in a trauma response to the the bigger climate change impacts that we're all living under and not forgetting the horrendous otherworldly events that are going on, um, then it's all too much. Mm. And that so I, I attended a, a grief workshop for circled facilitators in September in Devon. And there was a, a about over three days, and the first day was relatively a, about personal experience, and the second day was more about how do we facilitate grief circles for others? And many of them there were either 
focused on breath work or were going to be training in breath work, I said, hang on a minute, do you understand trauma? Do you understand chronic trauma? How does it manifest? It's not the same as something in the moment. And this to in where, wherever we are, wherever we stand, whether artists, um, academics, therapists, whatever, we have to be more aware of what chronic trauma is mm. because okay. we're all living it. Mm. And it's, it's not the same, you know, um, I've learned so many different meditation practices and breath work techniques. I mean, even um, this week, I'm attending um, something called the All Project over five days. So every single morning and evening, I'm being sent a very short video, um, which is on the whole really awe-inspiring. But at the beginning of each one is a breathwork practice, breathing in for so many seconds, breathing out for so many seconds. I ignore it because I know that it triggers me. <laughs> Well, you do right to do so. And, you know, it's it's a really good point because I, it's not the first time, you know, I'm not working in the psychotherapeutic um, profession. And yet it's still not the first time that someone has talked about breath work being really problematic. Um, and it is and different things are helpful for different people. Um, certainly my own experience is that it took me a very long time before I um, was remotely able to go anywhere near meditating um, and that you know that that absolutely just wouldn't have worked um, at a different time in my life and so I do think that we we need to just be aware of what's causing us problems and what's helpful and and it's just not the same for everyone but you're definitely not alone in um experiencing that i can see kate dufton's nodding vigorously um, yeah and, and i think what the beauty of um content and you know accessibility wise um then the beauty of that is that we don't have to actually think about anything of that because nature will guide us mm. and nature will supply what any individual needs in the moment. Mm. And that, that, so th this is, you know, my, the main reason I gave up a psychotherapy practice to be able to help people to connect with nature because I realized that this was going to be more of um, a, um, a life enforcing life affirming way of moving forward mm. then constantly going over you know story whereas connecting with nature even though sometimes where right now i'm living in jersey where people are traumatized because of tornado going through and loss of trees loss of homes etc um and luckily no lives human lives um but there's a huge um impact with the loss of the trees and you know, it's enabling people to come back to that, um, because we can't go into the woods at the moment. Um, paths are shut down. The trees are, you know, everywhere. And um, it's it, it's not something we are familiar. With. Um, I've lived in places, um, and it has been for a long time. But it's being seen everywhere, and you know, as in natural living. I've got friends that live in most of the U.S. Either wildfire or smoke, can't breathe, or flooding, earthquakes. You know, th there is so much. In Britain, we, we're we're kind of privileged because we don't have very much of it really in our faces, really disturbing our day-to-day -day way of life. And um, absolutely, I can see Australia, I absolutely know. I have a son that lives in Sydney, so I'm mm. aware of what's happening there as well. 
and in Britain, we have to find ways of connecting with nature because that's where we can identify with what everything else is happening. Mm, thank you. I'm, I, I'm very much resonate with the connection to nature. I know not everyone does. And thank you also, Kate, for putting that in the chat that different people really do have different ways. But also for me, connecting with nature. Uh, I'm also from Jersey. And um, I also see in the chat, I just want to share a couple oh, yeah. of here. And so is my dad, who's in the audience. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I just see here, um, in my personal artwork, I love collage, painting, finding different papers, textures, and then cutting them up and reassembling to create something new, beautiful, different. It reminds me again and again of the possibility to remake reimagine restart even with the simplest things i have in front of me and i just wanted to read that out thank you so much for sharing that because it's really beautiful and i think it it reminds us of the way that all manner of different creative processes in themselves just that act of creating always has in it somehow a little bit of hope because it is creating something new out of those materials, whatever, whether we're working with really difficult material or not. So I really appreciate that um, coming down into the chat there. Um, and um, I'm just looking down the chat to see um, my work and art practice uses scenography and architecture, making outer spaces helps to construct inner spaces and vice versa. I love that. Um, your PhD sounds like it's amazing. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, mm. I think dancing is good. This is this is this is also another thing that I really enjoy. I really like dancing, and not everyone likes dancing. Um, it's not everyone's cup of tea, but I really like full on um, both dancing to music in the kind of traditional dancing to music around my kitchen kind of sense, but also like really, really um, like totally free dancing where you you where you've got a studio space that you can go wild in and that you can really just you can open up and explore out and out. Um, you know, I am that's that's I, I just absolutely love dancing. And um, drumming and humming. I love drumming and humming. Yes. Singing and connecting to inner and outer nature. Yeah. Yeah. Dancing to shamanic drumming. Mm. Work that can connect people who aren't just, uh, who can't just get outside into nature. Yeah. This is so, so important. Absolutely. Um, and just, um, opening up creative moments and moments of connection um, and, and bringing, for people who really feel a connection to nature, bringing nature into people in whatever ways we can and the smells of nature or, you know, the objects that we can bring to people and that we can share with people um, and the imagination as well. Um, so um, very, very... Uh, now I'm I'm blushing because I can see the messages. <laughs> Virtual walks online using bi biophilic design. That's a really lovely idea. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's. I think. I I think that it's. It's th at times like these that people do actually really come up with very beautiful ideas and it just made me think of those moments you know in during the really difficult times of the pandemic where people did so many beautiful things and it made me think of a moment where i i came out of i was living in greece for quite a long time which i'm moving to scotland partly due to climate change unfortunately but um it made me think of being in my flat in Greece during the pandemic and really not having seen anyone for quite a long time and coming out to go and take my rubbish down to the bin. You were allowed to do that. 
and finding that my neighbour from downstairs had left a bag of homemade cookies hanging on my door handle. And just, you know, the like just such a lovely, lovely thing to do and such a small, beautiful gesture. Um, and because she was alone and I was alone. And um, yeah, it, it, that, that there are these moments. And I think that one of the challenges of the climate crisis is the the length and the, the the kind of exhausting nature of it but finding those moments where we can connect and we can just find something very beautiful to share um and i think we're coming kind of coming to the end and i feel like i do want to share with you just to close um a couple of quotations about hope because I've been struggling with hope quite a lot um, in not having any <laughs> um, and finding ways to be hopeful and for hope to sit alongside um, the other more difficult emotions and um, I'm going to share a quotation actually that it's not the one that it's 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 not Rebecca Solnit um, from Hope in the Dark. It's not Johnson and Macy on Active Hope, but it is uh, two of my colleagues, one of whom's a very, very close friend, um, Nadine Andrews and Paul Hoggett um, from a chapter that they wrote um, a few years ago. And um, it is the hope that comes from being able to face the worst is an enduring hope because it is not built upon a scaffolding of illusion and wishful thinking. It is defiant and courageous and refuses to capitulate to what might seem like hopeless odds. So I think with that, I'll you know say thank you to Kasia for organizing this um, and um, Thank you to everyone for coming and for contributing and to, for sharing and um, putting up with my tech disaster. <laughs> hey, thank you so much. Um, I'm probably echoing everyone, but uh, as you are signing out, yeah, once again, big thank you, Kate, for sharing. You speak so beautifully and uh, yeah, I'm gonna be calling you more often now <laughs> just so we can chat about this more um i've just popped in a chat a little message about the upcoming workshops in leeds so for anyone around there please feel free some more details can be um, found on the website they will appear there soon so if you'd like to join please do uh, and join cpa We've got so much resource, and this is one of the reasons why we've organized this chat. So you can hear more about it, know more about it, and know that there is a lot, a lot of people out there who want to chat. So reach yeah. out to the CPA. Um, if you just click on CPA online, it can take you through all sorts of climate cafes and circles and events. Please do it. I will um, actually send out. Um, uh afterwards to everyone who registered because a lot of people registered um but weren't able to come so i will send out a recording and i will send out um with that also uh just a list of links and resources um for anyone who wants them i think i might have put uh, a few kind of resources the link to the support resource as well on emails out um already for the cpa so um do 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 you know, make use of of those and um, be in contact. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm gonna hold okay. the space. Yeah. While you go, thank you. Thank you.